Hi, welcome to the bathtub. This is uh, this is the uh, the second of our uh, special uh, post influenza editions. It's the, the post influenza edition of the uh, the bathtub. So we want to take a look. What you have when you have a chest cold, you spend a lot of time in the bath, and it's a good place. Great time, great time to get to catch up on your reading. And uh, I'm trying to do a couple of quick ones to catch up. I wanted to talk fairly briefly today because uh, there's a misinterpret. I think it's probably fair to say that we haven't done our due for poetry in the bathtub on this series, and mainly because I love to read poetry in the bathtub, and I don't know, I, I, I feel really incapable of saying anything about it, but then I realized I'm not saying anything about the fiction, so I might as well talk about poetry, because I, I can't talk about fiction anyway. So um, I, I was doing a piece this week in the past, past several, well, the past couple of months, rereading and, and reading a biography about one of my favorite American poets, who's Elizabeth Bishop. Um, I can't say why I like Elizabeth Bishop. I have no idea why. I just really enjoy reading her stuff. It's, it's, it's very strange. It's enigmatic. It's very emotional. She's very funny. Um, and it's not, you know, super clever, clever stuff. It, it does make me laugh, and it, it's, it's something moving about it. Um, reading the biography, this new book by Thomas Travisano, this is a good book to read. The biographies, by the way, are good in the bathtub. They're, you might learn something, unfortunately, but and you might even be able to write a paper about it, but um, it's still quite fun. I enjoyed reading this book in the bathtub, particularly because while I've read other biographies of Bishop, this one is a little more of a, a story of her life. And Travis Sano does a nice job when he, review, when he reads the poems of Bishop. Uh, she only, you know, she only published a hundred poems in her life. She'd lived until her sixties, mid late sixties. She published very slowly. I think she spent. She would sometimes, like ten years, she would publish a small book of poems. There's a couple of scenes in this book where he just, where I think Robert Lowell writes a poem about Bishop writing poems, and in her house she would have like billboards all over the walls with like words and you know line you know like no you know, like those horrible homeland shows I hate homeland and they've always got those scenes where they're trying to figure out who the super killer is and they got strings all over. she sounds like you know the woman in homeland and she would spend just years some of the poems it turns out she spent 25 years working on until she just got the right word. Uh, and listening to her talk about it she speaks about her own poetry and she's quoted quite a bit in it very no nonsense She'll, she'll often say what I think most of the good writers I know will often say, which is, um, I wrote that line, and I didn't know what it meant, but it, I knew it was right. She often says that, and I found the last part of this way and that way. And, and her poems, when you read them, they, they don't just say, oh, here, I'm delivering this meaning or anything like this. They're very contemplative, and they're very emotionally complicated and complex, and they, they move you. Uh, that's all about the best I can say about uh, the wonderful Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, there's this, th these are interesting volumes. I've read quite a few recently for some reviews and for personal personal pleasure. These are these Library of America series who, who you know started off doing all the big classics like Emerson and Poe and so forth, and they've been catching up with some of the living writers. Uh, this is a really nice, they've done some really nice ones on, on poets, because it's really nice to have this one volume, and it has all of her poems, most of her essays, a good selection of her letters. I'm not a big reader of letters, but she wrote voluminously of letters. She um, had a very sad, kind of sad childhood, a kind of a sad and, and lucky childhood, I guess I would say, for a writer. Her parents both died when she was very young. One was when One died, and one went into a mental institution, and she was alone. She lived uh, with some pretty... Some fairly unpleasant sounding you know, family members, and was found happiness in school. When she went to school, all girls schools and with her friends, and she became a little more popular. She began to love literature, and she lucked out in the sense that she had a, an income because they left you know, family left her fairly well off. So she spent her life going to pretty far away places. She spent a long part of her life in Brazil with a partner of hers there, and. Um, and had that luxury to sit and spend ten years writing a poem. So good, good for her. Uh, and uh, and this book pretty much covers. You pretty much get this book and get you get all the poems. And you have um, you have all this other material as well. I I just picked a few, a couple of samples. Uh, I've been picked a couple from the late poems, but all the way through. If you like, Marianne Moore was a big was her mentor. 
And Marianne Moore is another poet I like, and you might want to enjoy might enjoy her if you like Bishop, or vice versa. This is one of her late poems. It's called One Or I guess it turns out to be her most famous poem, or most often reprinted poem next to the fish. And it's a villanelle. I, I've done these in classes with my students, but it's a very kind of complicated villanelle. So um, the most famous villanelle you know is the Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. And it's the organizing of a line. So you have two or three lines that are con constantly recurring. Bishop doesn't just do the whole line over and over, as many villanelle writers do. She, she shifts them around every single time she uses them. But she has this one great line, which is the opening line of this poem. It's very short, and I thought I'd just read it to you. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. I, I just find that moving and kind of beautiful. It, it sounds clinical, it sounds obvious, it sounds like it's objective, but the notion that you can lose things and things are born to be lost, and it's done without emotion, it's done with that sentimentality, and it arouses a, a real emotion when I read it. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last, or next to last, of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster some realms I own, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture, I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it like disaster. And it's a love poem to some uh, one of her partners or she, she's lost in, in various ways by the time she writes this poem. A beautiful poem. You can read it over and over. It's just really a, a touching poem. And I just one more last. I'm just going to read the opening of something I like called Crusoe in England. Uh, Bishop was a very quiet person. She considered herself a very isolated person. Most people who knew her, she was a very social person, but she lived in her, she lived off by herself with her, with her partners. Late in her life, she went to teach, but she was uh, not a, an easy person to approach, I guess. But many many people who knew her loved her. Crusoe in England, the idea is you come. Crusoe comes back from his island, and he brings that sense of isolation with him. And this is just the opening stanza. A new volcano has erupted. The papers say, and last week I was reading where some ship saw an island being born, at first a breath of steam ten miles away, and then a black fleck, basalt probably, rose in the mate's binoculars, and caught on the horizon like a fly. They named it. But my poor old island still unrediscovered, unrenameable. None of the books has ever got it right. Here's the biggest problem with these books. It's so hard to turn the pages. Well, I had 52 miserable small volcanoes I could climb with a few slithery strides, volcanoes dead as ash heaps. I used to sit on the edge of the highest one and count the others standing up, naked and leaden with their heads blown off. I'd think that if they were the size I thought volcanoes should be, then I had become a giant. And if I had become a giant, I couldn't bear to think what size the goats and turtles were, or the gulls, or the overlapping rollers, a glittering hexagon of rollers, closing and closing in, but never quite glittering and glittering. The sky was mostly overcast. She's a, she's a formally uh, strong writer, so she has really interesting and complicated formal little structures working through most of her poems, which I can, can't really describe or explain because I don't understand formal, formal structure and poetry very well, except you can feel it in the rhythms. It's not stream of consciousness. It's not uh, free verse. It's not all the stuff that you, you probably learned in high school about poetry. It, it, they're, they're very tight poems, and they all invent, they're all adventurous poems. Um, but And they, they seem very distant, but they're, they always draw you in, 
And every time you read them, they, they mean something. They give you a little more. She's a wonderful poet. I, I can't recommend Elizabeth Bishop enough. This is a good volume to have. We there's no way I can there's no way I guess they can do it. I wish they could make these papers. These these pages are so tissue paper thin. I need like a razor blade to to get between the pages. But other than that, that's a really nice volume. Really good biography, literary biography. He doesn't bullshit you with just sit around scanning poetry and you know talking about thematic continuity or any of that crap. He just reads the poems and points out some of the lovely passages and may connect them to parts of her life um, and might give you some idea of how the poem is structured better than I could. But um, it's a good good book and it's a good read in the bathtub. All right, happy bathing uh, from the master bather. Um, see you soon in poetry in the bathtub. Can't go wrong with poetry in the bathtub. Okay, bye.